Good afternoon and uh, Elad, uh, good evening. We're here uh, together this afternoon, oh, I'm sorry, with uh, Elad uh, Borovsky, who's the director of adult residential uh, program at Returno uh, in Israel. We're gonna be learning a lot this afternoon about Returno and their substance use disorder treatment programs. Um, and uh, together with Elad, we have with us today, Dr. Matis Shulman, who is a psychiatrist working specifically in uh, addiction treatment and has done research into opioid use disorder treatments, this currently serves as an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University. Thank you so much to uh, both of you for joining us today so we can learn a little bit more about the state of substance use disorder treatment and how people can guess, best get help. Um, for uh, substance use disorders. Um, you know, we at Refuat HaNefesh uh, spend a lot of time thinking about destigmatization, how to uh, help the community think about mental health treatment, mental health disorders, mental wellness in ways which allow people to discuss them openly and uh, without uh, shame. And uh, to some degree, substance use disorder is one of the uh, most uh, difficult uh, disorders in that regard, um, because some people conceive of them of, as stemming from something that somebody does to themselves, that it's a choice um, for, um, it's a choice for people uh, to engage in substance use, and that uh, therefore, to some degree, uh, it's their fault. Uh, and of course, that can be something which is uh, stands in the way of people seeking treatment and finding the help that they need. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit in terms of the, the patients that you see, and particularly within the Jewish community as a whole, to what degree uh, and in what ways does the uh, stigma around substance use disorder uh, interrupt or get in the way of people seeking treatment and what are some other ways to conceive of substance use disorder, which can help communities and families be supportive of people struggling with it? Uh, Who do you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Shulman. You can go uh, first. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. You know, it's great to be back uh, giving a uh, talking with uh, uh, your organization and again. Um, they're fun enough is doing great work and it's always nice to speak with you all. Um, so uh, with regards to stigma and substance use disorders, you're right, it's it's probably the, sort of, there, there's an added level of stigma um, around substance use disorders because of the um, kind of the belief, there's a belief that people choose, there's a choice that's happening. Um, there's, there's a, uh, maybe an association with parts of our society which we don't um, we don't like or we don't you know maybe we're not don't associate with Orthodox with Orthodox Jewish community the Jewish community um, so I think when I talk to people about this to try to um, dissuade them of these beliefs um, you know the first thing I say is that you know we we've moved in the field from believing that this is a moral failing which was sort of the the, the generally accepted view um, maybe 100 years ago. Um, if you read the, the medical textbooks of the time, they speak about how addiction is a moral failing. They're the the um, person who suffers from addiction is, uh, you know, a sort of a flawed, flawed individual, a really very stigmatizing negative language. Um, but over the years, the field has come to realize that it's really not um, any different than many other diseases, certainly mental health issues um, and, and other uh, medical problems, and that uh, a, a large portion of the risk uh, for substance use disorders is really genetic, biological. Um, people who have done studies where they look at the likelihood of having a problem if you have identical twins versus um, fraternal twins. So that's how you kind of can start piecing out whether a problem is genetic or, or other things, environmental. They're able to show that at least 50% of the risk for substance use disorders, pretty much across the board, is genetic. Um, and we know that you know some people just react differently to substances. Like someone, some people drink alcohol and they feel sick and they're not going to develop a problem with alcohol. Other people, their bodies are just 
built in a way that when they drink, they uh, it's much more reinforcing, it's much more enjoyable. They don't get that sick, so it's much more likely that they'll develop a problem. And it's really nothing to do with their choices, right? It's not. It's nothing about whether they're a good or bad person, whether they made a bad choice or not. It's really about. Um, it's really just about you know. It's just like if you happen to have diabetes or cancer or some other problems. So is another problem. So that's really, I think, the strongest argument against the stigma for substance use disorders. And that's what I, I always start with that, and I think it's important. I and mean, there's lots of other things to talk about. I think we, the other side I'll say is that we all suffer sometimes with behaviors that we don't like, that maybe we watch too much Netflix or we eat too much sugar or we can't stop drinking you know, um, soda or, or, or eat, we eat too much cake at the Shabbos Kiddush. You know, everyone struggles with things. I think it's, it's wrong to, to stigmatize a group of people that they struggle with something that maybe is more dangerous for whatever reason, but we all have a side to us that struggles with this problem and, and um, we should all, I think it's, it's, it's wrong for our society to, to stigmatize these people, not to provide care. We should be empathetic when people are suffering and, and really try to work on making sure that people get the resources they need to recover and help them facilitate their recovery. So that's my long-winded answer. <laughs> I'll let you uh, if you want to add anything, please. Yeah, well, a lot of I'm, I'm specifically interested in in hearing the people who come to you for treatment. You know, to what degree do you find that they have internalized some of this stigma that they themselves view themselves as having a moral failing, and to what degree has that perhaps stood in the way of them seeking out treatment earlier? So, first of all. Uh, shalom and good evening. It's uh, thanks for the opportunity to be with you, and uh, I appreciate your organization and the activity. And I wish also in Israel that those kinds of activities were would be much more powerful and effective uh, to get uh, help to people. Uh, I will open and say that uh, in our therapeutic community, and this is my department in uh, in Retorno. First of all, let's say, let's talk about Retorno. Retorno has, uh, an, uh, uh, for the whole spectrum, uh, beginning with the prevention of, uh, of uh, to, to deal with all the people, teachers, rabbis, uh, uh, doctors, even that need to understand and to learn about the addiction, to identify those, uh, those situations. And uh, inpatient, uh, inpatient facility, and uh, also in the middle, people who need a counsel, uh, counsels with someone, and to to see whether they are on addiction or not. For the department of the therapeutic community, it's uh, people are coming usually, uh, usually thinking they don't have any problem. Uh, I don't have any problem, I'm not an addict, but my wife thinks I'm an addict, or the police thinks, or it's uh, uh, or the, my boss, in, uh, my work that fired me yesterday, and he told me that I need to go to therapy in uh, condition to get me back to work. All of those things, uh, all of those people uh, are sure that uh, I have a problem. So that's the first step. People are coming just uh, because the life have become, uh, has become unmanageable. Something in the way got wrong. They are clashing into reality, into, uh, into uh, something about their expectations from life. Something went wrong in those, uh, in those uh, experiences of their life. Usually, we are dealing to, to relate to those feelings of those accidents in life, of uh, misconceptions about those tragic events that are happening to them. And uh, this is when they want to start to, to talk about the problem and to deal with, uh, with the general problem of addiction. We are uh, distinguishing between addiction and substance abuse. Substance abuse is more the psychiatric and medical uh, term. Uh, alcohol abuse, all of those, uh, all of those specific diagnoses, or mental and behavioral uh, 
disorders, but we are dealing with much more wide diagnosis as addiction. Addiction is a kind of a container to a lot of uh, behavioral issues and, uh, this, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, difficulties in uh, social relationships that the addiction or the drug or the alcohol was kind of a replacement. Some people are uh, calling it a, a wrong solution or uh, my uh, problem of the, the social functioning. For example, uh, if I can uh, take a younger man that is uh, like a, a adolescent that is going to the pub or to the bar, you know, I don't know how you call it, and is like uh, even like from and he's like, uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, a woman in the end of the line and he wants to say hello, but he's feeling anxiety and he doesn't want to approach and he, and he doesn't want to, to say even hello. And he drinks even one cup of alcohol and then uh, one shot. And he can, now he had that, uh, he feels uh, that he's capable of doing that. So the alcohol gave him a social benefit, as something, some advantage. But now he can function and do stuff without, with, uh, with this uh, this uh, substance, and uh, to gain all of what he couldn't do without those uh, uh, addictions. What we are trying to do, in a general, and we will get into details with that, is to that to help him her or her to achieve the social uh, activities or achievements or uh, abilities without any other substances in, uh, or, uh, or pathological uh, behaviors. That's what we are trying to do. Okay, so with that, I'm, I'm interested to hear, and, and maybe uh, Dr. Shulman, if you can share with us, you know, what are some of the, you know, kind of uh, main modalities of treatment that exist, you know, to help uh, somebody with a substance use disorder or addiction, or, you know, exactly what the classification is to, um, you know, interrupt those pathways, those connections that, that make them uh, rely on and, and feel the need for the substances in order to achieve what they're looking to achieve? Sure. So um, obviously it's a big topic. I don't want to speak for the rest of the hour on on, on, on how to treat substance use disorders, but um, trying to think where we could start. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the, the addiction field, the first thing I think to think about is actually level of care um uh you know what co what context are we treating someone in so um you know we oftentimes when people are suffering from a substance use disorder uh when it involves a substance you know when it involves um uh, there, there's a, the first step in the process is breaking the cycle of um using the substance and then going to withdrawal so uh, addiction when it's sort of in its worst uh in, 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 in its worst form, or right, as, as the things are not going well, people, um, whatever other problems may be led to the addiction problem, the substance itself becomes the problem. What happens is people are using the drug or alcohol. If they stop using the drug or alcohol, they'll go into withdrawal. They'll be very uncomfortable. Maybe they could have even dangerous uh, consequences of stopping abruptly. So the first thing we think about in a sort of severe substance use disorder um, is actually trying to break that cycle, uh, usually through, often through a higher level of care where, pe where people are actually living uh, or, 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 or staying at a place where they're getting treatment. Uh, traditionally, that's been called detoxification. So you, you have sort of, a, sort of trying to stop the person from getting, uh, from requiring the, the substance to have their body be uh, at sort of equilibrium. So. Uh, I think that's often, depending on the situation, obviously, but in, in, in certain substances, many cases, that's the first thing that we need to do. Um, it's certainly not all we need to do, but that's often the start, or, or, or it's at least something to think about. Um, it's a first step. Um, the, the next thing to do is to think about, well, how are we going to keep this person, or how are we going to allow them to start on their road towards recovery? 
Um, and usually, in most cases, that involves um, psychosocial support and, and, and intervention. So, uh, group therapy, individual therapy, um, a, a lot of substance use disorder world is is built upon group therapy, um, and you know the evidence based substance use disorder therapies are many. Um, a couple, just to name them, sort of our uh, motivational interviewing is one, relapse prevention therapy is one, mindfulness-based relapse prevention, um, uh, contingency management would be, those are sort of those, the big ones, I'd say. Um, they're, they're all sort of dealing with the problem in different ways. Oh, I didn't mention 12-step facilitation, I should mention that. Uh, uh, so that's related to sort of the Alcoholics Anonymous world. So there's all different um, types of therapy. Uh, the evidence is that as long as you're using an evidence-based therapy, they all work about the same. Uh, but it's always a challenge to keep people engaged. It's always a challenge to keep people in, 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 in the therapy. Um, addressing comorbidities, which I think a lot was referring to, maybe if someone's having some anxiety, um, maybe social anxiety, trying to treat that, obviously an also important part of treatment. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that starts answering the question. I don't want to kind of go on and on. We can talk about details of any of these if, if you wish, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to leave it at that for now so we can, um, uh, think about, uh, where, you know, what else we want to talk about. Yeah. Well, I, I think that is a good segue and a lot, I'll come back to you in a second, just in terms of, you know, there being a multiplicity of different types of, uh, you know, evidence-based modalities, which prove effective so then you know when we come to you know looking at one particular program understanding you know what sets them apart why they're you know choosing the modalities that they choose and and understanding the you know the 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 picture um i think which we'll get into of a program like returnos you know the sort of culture of that uh you know of that program beyond you know just the therapeutic modality which they've chosen but before I turn back to you, Elad, let me just say for those who are, uh, you know, viewing this uh, via Facebook, um, we're really interested in, in hearing your questions. You can put the questions uh, as a comment uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the video, and uh, that question will get transmitted to me. If you're interested in asking your question uh, and not having your name uh, associated with it, you can email uh, info at refuadanefesh.org. And that question will get passed along to me as well. And then I'll read that question anonymously, but definitely very interested in, in hearing your questions. Um, yeah, so a lot. So turning to you, so can you talk a little bit about uh, which choices Returno has made in terms of which therapeutic modalities to use and kind of the larger picture of, you know, what, you know, methodology Returno is using and, and you know, what sets it apart from other, uh, from other types of programs? Okay, so uh, in the uh, return in the process, first of all, the extension of the program is like between uh, seven to 10 months, in the intensive uh, community uh, treatment. In the community, we are dealing in two different aspects. First of all, is uh, in Lashon HaKadosh, we say, Sur Mera, the asset of. First of all, Sur Mera, it's tough to harm. It's up to do uh, bad things. And in the first couple of months, we are dealing with regulate your reactions. We see addiction is like dealing with in, uh, impulses and, uh, and uh, to deal with uh, not to react to any emotional, uh, emotional uh, event that is happening and surrounding you. Every first step, of, uh, of drug use or alcohol abuse is starting with an emotional event that is leading to a, a choice. In that point, he still, he or she has a choice whether how to deal with this emotional overwhelming and uh, to deal with uh, how we experience that. We are using that also in a uh, in the CBT, cognitive behavioral uh, therapies and instruments, but also using all the time the power of the group, of the community. Every time a person is 
uh, holding back his reaction. For example, someone is annoying him or her and she, and she or he, instead of reacting automatically, very in an impulsive way, she or he are choosing to be constructive, to make some uh, delay with his or her reaction to go to, to think about what, uh, what she experienced right now. That's the first goal of the first couple of months, to, to be able not to react and to share. The second step is to be able to, to talk about it, to share, to explain to other people, to, hope, to the whole group, to the whole community, what I've just been through. And that's uh, for... Uh, for someone who is using uh, drugs for a couple of years or alcohol for the first time to stand in front of 40 people and to explain that right now he finished a phone call with his family and uh, his parents told him something horrible. And instead of just going to his room and drink something to relax or to He's standing and sharing his embarrassment, his disappointment from his parents, his uh, disappointment, disappointment from himself. Those things are the, the, the first uh, qualities and uh, instruments that the patient of Reptono has to, uh, has to gain in, uh, in order to deal with addiction. The second, of the, of the goal in, all in the system is to take responsibility. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not enough, it's not enough not to react or to share and to talk about it, but also to think like uh, in advance of situations, to think about risk factors. For example, if you know that uh, some uh, work or job or some people, or some uh, events are dangerous, can be emotional uh, to trigger your emotional uh, overwhelming and uh, all of those bad memories, to be able to, to consult about it, to, to live a life of, uh, of being every time, to, be, uh, to plan your day, to plan, but not in a, like missions or things like that. This is also important. But this is a further, uh, further uh, level, but to understand which type of life is suitable for you. And this is what we are working on the community in the second step. This is the foundation of the treatment work. Oops, sorry, I was still muted. Uh, okay, so it sounds like, um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, intensive uh, work which is being done in terms of a person understanding and practicing uh you know coping skills and skills to be able to uh you know manage those moments of you know wanting to go back to the substance and and figuring out how not to and i know that um you know one of the big things that people are concerned about in the world of uh, substance use treatment is relapse, right? Is that somebody goes through a program, whether it's a, you know, a 60 day program or a seven month program or however long it is, um, you know, there's a, you know, long-term and sh short-term and long-term effectiveness. Um, you know, so uh, if we could turn back to Dr. Shulman for a moment, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the all the, diff the different modalities that were research-based that that seem to, you know, work in similar ways. Um, you know, what is the, the research in terms of their long-term effectiveness? You know, how, what percentages of people are, are able to remain uh, drug-free or alcohol-free for long periods of time? And what are some of the factors that lend towards um, that, you know, treatment sticking in the long-term? <laughs> Okay, good question. That's a big question, asking some big ones. So um, I, uh, you know, I think, a well, a couple things I'll say. Um, one is that uh, we, we know that people who are remain in the therapeutic community for a long time, like 10 months, they do quite well. Um, 
there is, I think, an open question in the research world. Are those a self-selecting group? Um, or is it the therapeutic community is needed for those people to do better? But we know that people who stay in a therapeutic community for a long time do well. The, the challenge is uh, in substance use disorder is that many people can't stay or are not willing to stay uh, for 12 months, uh, 10 months, 12 months in the, in the same place and sort of put their life on hold while they're recovering. And some people just can't. They have families, they have jobs, they have other responsibilities. Um, so, I, I, so, but I guess with regards to, since we were talking about the return out approach and therapeutic community, it is a valid approach. It's difficult to study actually because it's just so long and, you know, we don't usually randomize people to either be in a therapeutic community for a, a year or not, but, but we have good outcomes for people who stay. Um, the, uh, you know, the question of, of how, uh, what percentage of people do well, um, it really depends on the substance and many other factors I, I, I can't say it's just kind of uh, uh, off the bat I'll say a couple things one is that for opioid use disorder we know that most people will relapse without medication for opioid use disorder so I just want to make sure we put that out for everyone um, if you have a relative with an opioid use disorder uh, more than you know more than 90 percent of, of people often relapse within the first few months if they're detoxed uh, without medication so that's an important um, important thing to think about. Um, actually, people who stay in therapeutic communities don't always need medicine. The problem is therapeutic communities are not able to keep people against their will, and there's always a risk they will leave and then relapse and, and have a problem and, and overdose. So with opioid use disorder, it's uh, always recommended to be on medication, um, either Suboxone, buprenorphine, um, Vivitrol, which is an opioid blocker or uh, or methadone, but but that's sort of a just with regard to that one substance. With regards to other substances, I think um, you know it really depends on where the person is, modalities, and other things. But we also keep in mind, even if someone does relapse in the future um, and go back to using substances, this is a chronic illness. Um, we kind of expect that there's going to be a rocky road. We don't expect that people are going to. It, there's, I think we all want the medical system to provide easy fixes, like providing antibiotics for an infection um, or fixing a, a broken arm uh, with a cast and then healing and being finished. Uh, substance use disorders we really should think about as um, chronic illness like diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, things go well for a while. We want to keep people towards recovery, but there's always a good chance that there's going to be a you know a rough patch in the future and and sort of maybe you have to have a course adjustment. People sometimes will go to a place like Returno for, for a long time, feel better for a couple of years, but then have a problem and then maybe need to go to an outpatient program or a, a month of treatment or go back for another year or maybe not. It really depends on the person. Um, it really depends on, on the situation. But, you know, we definitely, I think, we think about uh, recovery uh, over the long term, we expect that things are, are not always going to be smooth sailing. Um, it's a chronic illness, and it's relapsing and, and remitting. And um, and we shouldn't sort of be shocked when that happens, and we also have to sort of plan around that. Um, building the per Thinking about how people have to... Thinking about not just stopping the substances, but also building up recovery in terms of positive things in a person's life. Um, I always tell people, you know, like when they ask, when, when should I come off medications for opioid use disorder? I say, well, once you feel like your, your life has totally changed, you're, you're in recovery in terms of that you have a job now, you have a family, you have a different living situation, your life is very different. That's when you can start, I think, um, that's when people are much less likely to relapse. So it's really about building recovery, building, and you know, in order to do that, you often need the skills that were referred to, learning how to deal with impulses, learning how to deal with other people, um, the trick is getting people to, to stick with that and to learn those skills. It's not easy, um, but but that's sort of that's what I'd say about uh, about recovery and about um, the percentages. I can't give you exact percentages on each on each uh, substance. But. I I agree with uh, Dr. Shulman, and uh, I'm always telling my patients because every uh, uh, after. Uh, in average, three days in the community, every patient is coming and saying, wow, I will never touch any drug again in my life. Everyone, it's the same speech. And uh, 
in uh, the staff, we are always telling them the statistics, the statistics are against them. Probably every one of them is going to have some relapse in his life or her life. But what we can see is that as long as you being in treatment, the, the size or the, uh, the depth of the falling or the relapse, which be much shorter the time, because you will be as in part as uh, you will be in a part of on a network that you will be part of that, and you will know who to call and to who seek help, and uh, that and everyone that come for a second uh, round to retorno, and uh, he finish with success. It's it's much more effective treatment for the next time but for uh, but it's really clear that it's a long term uh, a business and a chronic illness that you need to be always uh, always uh, aware to that to the, the to the risks that you have uh, to deliver the metaphor that uh, that we're using and also in an uh, an A, the narcotic anonyms, is that addiction is kind of like a, an allergy. That uh, and every time that you're going to a restaurant, you want to see the ingredients of the food. So every time that you want to go to a society or a, a social event, you need to find out who would be the people there. Will be there in alcohol or will be there uh, a cannabis or weed or something like that that to smoke and you need to be to understand that you have some allergy, uh, mental allergy to those things and to, to live your life according to that. Yeah, okay. Well, that that's, you know, certainly sounds uh, on, on the one hand quite helpful, but, it, but it's also, you know, quite challenging to, you know, think about, to conceptualize, I'm sure, for oneself that uh, instead of being, you know, somebody who's uh, overall well and has a problem which can be fixed, to rather, you know, sort of come to the conceptualization that I have a chronic illness or allergy or something that's really going to be with me uh, for my whole life. Like I can. I, I just want to add that, uh, as uh, to refer to what Dr. Schulman said, we are really encouraging people to use psychiatric help during the treatment. The these days, the antidepressants, anti-anxieties, the medications are amazing without any like a side effects and uh, a little bit of side effects, but we can see that it helps to deal with urges, with uh, to regulate the reactions. And uh, if it's like combined the, the therapy with a good psychiatrist that can analyze when to add the dose or when to, uh, and to adjust that, it can be like a manageable in a very effective way. Yeah. Okay, so I want to turn to, uh, you know, Returno in particular and understand, you know, some of the ways in which it differs from other programs. I know, you know, some of the things that I heard about and saw in my, you know, reading is that, you know, Returno makes use of engaging uh, the residents at Returno in, you know, certain kinds of, uh, you know, activities with, uh, you know, uh, horseback riding and, uh, you know, manual uh, labor and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And also, you know, quite a bit of talk about the, you know, post-residential uh, communication and the way in which, uh, you know, the, the, the being part of the community, as you mentioned, continues. I don't know if that really, you know, captures the main point, but if you could kind of put into your words, you know, what makes Returno's methodology um, different and kind of if we could then head towards, you know, why would you know, we understand if somebody's in Israel and there's a program in Israel, you know, okay, it's a good program to go to. Why is there an overseas program? Why would people from all over the world be considering going to Israel for this particular uh, treatment? Okay, so let's uh, define the return of treatment as tough love. We uh, try to correct the impression uh, of the, what people experience in their life, uh, the term of uh, what is to be tough, uh, to have limits and to have uh, borders, boundaries in uh, your uh, abilities, in your behavior. And, but all of this is being like, I don't know if it's 
I don't have any like other words to use it, but with a, a pure love to accept the person, whether uh, whether uh, he or she had uh, uh, did horrible things or made the, the addiction cause them to go to a, a very unmoral uh, actions or what uh, what they did with their life. And in the community, we are really trying to bring people to their helpless spot, to be powerless, to be helpless, and those and to experience that. We use uh, social activities for that, responsibilities, functioning in the society. And as I mentioned before, to be able and to encourage people to speak and to talk and to, to be angry and to express their feelings. Besides that, we have all what you mentioned, the, uh, the surrounding activities as horse riding, as uh, animal therapy and art therapy and sports, but every part of those things is, is not just like for fun. If the idea of all those things is to, uh, that the person who uh, participates in those uh, activities to write about it, to express, to share the feelings about it, and then uh, he needs to be, uh, to feel all the time that he's like around in emotional language. Um, and the idea is that someone will be, uh, uh, will feel, think about something, but with, with this kind of feeling, he will get up in the morning and will go to his day schedule and be able to function uh, even though he can feel right now overwhelmed or uh, all of those feelings that I uh, mentioned before. During the day, he needs to, to uh, reinforce his muscles of seeking help. This is really important. Everything in Retorno, you need to ask for. Nothing is going to, you won't get anything uh, because you, uh, you deserve that. You need to ask, you need to ask for that. You need to be, uh, to feel, to, to feel uh, whether you get, receive it or not. You need to uh, complain if someone, if something you didn't uh, get on time. And uh, that's the idea, uh, communication, and, uh, to, to, to encourage this, uh, to live in kind of uh, environment. Why Retorno and why Israel? Uh, I think that uh, in Retorno, the combination, uh, Retorno started as, a, as an answer for uh, mostly uh, people from the religious and the Haredi world, that uh, a lot of uh, addiction in those uh, in those people is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of in the families and a lot of, was part of a denial and the retorno knows how to deal with the surrounding an addict that is come for treatment it's really important that the family will be part of it he won't be an outcast he won't be like someone that need to be punished and then not someone, uh, someone uh, we are really working on that, that the, the families will know that they're not like sending the, the, the kid to be fixed or to be uh, repaired. And he's coming back, he's going to Israel and we are trying to make this time like uh, to stop life how they went till now. And now uh, the parents, the family has the opportunity to, get, to take care of themselves and in, uh, in the, in the, in the son or the girl or the daughter will now get treatment in a different place. This separation is really important for recovery, to deal with the problem and separate. And then after the nine or 10 months uh, to be uh, reunited again and to be able to live uh, together. When you finish with Tono, the treatment where the social worker is uh, uh, trying to locate for a, for a follow-up for the treatment, and the treatment must include uh, family therapy to be part of that. And uh, this is the idea that 
The idea is not like to fix yourself and uh, not just to uh, not touch drugs or not be used again. The idea is that uh, your social network will be uh, safe again, that you will be accepted, you won't be judged. And those things are really important to maintain the achievement that you achieve in the, the community. Okay, let me, uh, if I can, kind of uh, follow up on something you just said um, in terms of um, finding uh, one's place of helplessness. And, um, you know, I, I think that some people, um, you know, might hear that and uh, feel a sense of, you know, you use the word tough love, but that sounds, uh, you know, frightening. That sounds a little bit, uh, you know, mean. Why, why, why take somebody who's sick and force them into a position of, of feeling that sense of helplessness? So if you could help us understand what the, what the therapeutic value of that is and how that, uh, you know, how that kind of, you know, works out in an emotionally safe way. The community is, uh, is, we are trying to create a change, to create uh, some movement in life uh, in, a, in a short time, even though it's uh, almost a year that someone uh, has to be in return. Uh, it's a short time for an addict, uh, for a chronic uh, uh, disorder. And, uh, we need to move the person forward. The tricky thing about addiction is that usually, if I will take, for example, and uh, Dr. Schulman will agree with me, someone that has depression uh, will come to the doctor and we have a clinical, uh, a clinical picture of someone that uh, he lost his uh, interest in life. He looks sad, suffering, complaining. The, the idea and the, trage the tragedy about addicts that usually the people who are coming for the, for the treatment are usually like uh, an amazing people, everything is okay, and they are smiling, and we don't see because usually they are not using right now, they don't have the craving, and uh, the people that we are seeing in front of our eyes it's like we are calling, and all the families will also tell us, we, we name this syndrome as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He's an amazing person, but when the monster is coming out, when the monster is coming out, it's a different, it's a different person. Mm -hmm. The woman that is marrying a gambler, and he was a, an amazing husband for three years, but then in his fourth year, he got fired from his work and suddenly he got like into debts and things like that. And suddenly it's someone I didn't know. It's a kind of like a demon that was inside of him. And we want to bring this demon for the treatment. And the instrument that we are using is those helpless moments and situations. I agree, I agree, it's not easy. But uh, we are, the staff is very oriented about to feel, it's not that someone is like losing his temper completely and it's not like something aggressive. Usually in the back old days, uh, it used to be like uh, aggressive interventions uh, and also include uh, humiliations, things like that. I think the communities in Israel uh, inherited from, uh, from uh, communities in Europe and the States, but uh, and also from the army, I think that's the history, but we understand according to the, to the contemporary uh, theories that uh, the main thing is to find uh, the individual motivation. What is motivate you? And uh, we are focusing on that, uh, on that uh, places. Helpless situations, by the way, it's not has to be the picture of someone that is losing his temper and cursing and being violent. It's also someone that is like we are telling him, okay, let's say, for example, you need to get up tomorrow at 6.30. And uh, he is promising and I will get up in time. But even though he really wants to do that, he won't be able. Those, uh, and this is his helpless uh, spot that he's he can't say, I want to do 
a thing and I can't do that. And it's uh, like you're not controlling your own life. That's uh, what we are trying to reinforce in those people. The ability that you can uh, uh, deal with those helpless uh, uh, events in your life. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm happy that you guys moved away from the um, aggressive uh, confrontation. No, no, it was, uh, it's completely, uh, I'm always telling my staff, uh, before I came to Returno, I ran a clinic of a methadone and suboxone in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the methadone clinic was in a community, a community therapy before I came mm -hmm. to the methadone. And everyone there got through a confrontation uh, therapies and uh, it didn't work. It's not working. It's not, uh... Right, right. Now, that was what, I mean, I think that Bill Miller, when he came along with motivational interviewing, was reacting to the confrontational approaches of the 70s and uh, sort of had come to the realization that it wasn't really making, very, it wasn't really helping very much. So that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, people, when people are confronted, they often just push back more. So it's, uh, but yeah, but I, I think that the, I think that connecting with helplessness, yeah, I think maybe that that language is from the first step of 12 step, uh, exactly. 12 steps, right? So that, that actually, um, when, when the, uh, when the big book talks about, uh, which is the book of the 12 step, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous speaks about the helplessness, it actually refers to the idea of just acknowledging that we're powerlessness. Our powerlessness in life in general, acknowledging that we can't control everything and, and sounds like that's what you're trying to connect with, which is, I think, a good thing. So that's good. I, I, if you want, I'm happy to talk about um, sort of some of the th considerations around choosing where to go to treatment. So, I mean, if, sort of from an outside perspective, if you want. I yeah, think. yeah. So that that is one question that uh, somebody asked uh, online was, what are some things that a person should look for? when trying to pick the right, you know, treatment for them. And, um, you know, I, I just know that I, you know, since I started working at Refuet and Nefesh, so because they find our website, I get barraged with, you know, cold call emails from, uh, you know, uh, drug rehab programs all over saying, you know, let us advertise with you. And I've seen the, uh, you know, the occasional expose on on TV about, uh, you know, some some rehab programs that, uh, you know, some claim are, uh, you know, really not doing a, a proper job. And, you know, so I imagine that for somebody who's looking, let's say, for a family member for treatment, it might sort of be a frightening world of, uh, you know, how do I know that I'm sending, you know, my loved ones somewhere, uh, you know, safe and helpful rather than somewhere that's going to be uh, a negative experience for them. So, yeah, if Dr. Shulman, you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so it's it's uh, there's a lot of considerations, and uh, the first thing I should say is you have to think about whether your loved one needs to go or not. I think that there's I've had people come to me and they have a, you know a, a high school student smoking some marijuana, and they would be ready to send them off to a rehab for a year, and I'll say, well, I don't know if that's really the appropriate response in this situation. Seems to be functioning okay. You know, if we sent everyone who smoked marijuana to a year of rehab, we would we would run out of space in our rehabs very quickly, right? So so the American Society for Addiction Medicine actually has levels of care and, and based on the appropriateness. Um, so I think that that's the first thing to think about. You know, maybe this person could do okay going to drug testing three times a week in an intensive outpatient program, not having to go away. But there is pretty, I think it's a pretty common situation that people do have to go away from there current situation because substance use disorder is such a difficult to treat disease and it's very hard for people to stop in their home situation. Um, a lot of people do have to go away and, and once someone's making that decision where to go, um, you know, I think uh, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a few factors to consider. One is cost. Um, uh, there are a lot of programs that are quite good in the United States that are extremely expensive. Um, and if a person, if it's not a very extremely wealthy uh, group or you have resources from somewhere, um, not always the best use of your resources if you're gonna spend everything on a month when we know this is a chronic illness. So 
it's definitely it's something to consider and to balance. Um, other programs take some insurances, um, others don't. Um, Return All happens to be a program that I think is relatively cost efficient if, if you have a, a loved one who's willing to go and wants to go. Um, if you want to give them long-term treatment that's, you know, of, uh, you know, quality treatment, it's, it's a reasonable option. And, and so um, I think, you know, I think those are some of the things to think about. Um, I don't want to sort of give endorsements to any programs. I'll just say, you know, there are programs in the area where I practice, which is New York, New Jersey area, and I talked to some families about them recently, and they said, oh, actually, they told me we're going to pay about $50,000 for, for a 28-day program. And it is a lot of money. Um, and I can't tell people that that's the right way, you know, that's the right choice. Um, the insurance-based programs do have a different culture, different feeling. They aren't always as nice. Maybe they're not always appropriate for people who are in their first time going to treatment. So it is a difficult choice. There actually are some organizations that try to give some guidance on these things. I know Amudim and that's in a Brooklyn-based program, uh, uh, sort of advisory program, and then um, uh, a relief in in, um, in Lakewood uh, has the people that sort of speak with the programs and kind of know which programs are generally uh, high, higher quality and also have um, also have sort of uh, can accommodate uh, people that are, are Jewish or Orthodox Jewish. Um, so I think that those are some of the, 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 the things to consider. So it's, it's a difficult situation and I, I'm, you know, it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I think try to get some, some advice from people that have been through it also. So it's, I, I don't take that advice as, um, as gospel because people just know their own experience. They might say, oh, this program is great for my relative, but maybe for your relative that isn't right. Um, but, um, you know, I think getting some advice, uh, talking to one of these organizations in theory, um, you know, some of the things you can ask are if the person has an opioid use disorder, is my relative going to be allowed to be on Suboxone or, 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 or buprenorphine or, or methadone or Vivitrol? That, that's often a sign that the program is at least up with the evidence because they, they have programs that are sort of still practicing the way they practiced in in you know in, in, in previous decades or will say no we don't allow any of that um, even though it's very evidence-based so uh, you know there's some of the things you can ask but um those are the some of the considerations you might have and and um it is it is hard and and but remember it's a chronic problem and 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 so there's never one decision that you're going to make that's going to be the answer uh and you always want to try to make the right decision in each moment um Okay, and if uh, if somebody is looking for contact information about Amudim or Relief, both of those are listed on uh, our resource page at refuadanefesh.org. You can look at the resources. Uh, we do have those resources listed either alphabetically or um, by area of uh, resources, and we do have uh, addiction resources uh, there. So you can find the contact information for both Relief and Amudim uh, on that uh, on those pages. Um, I'll just uh, ask another question here that was asked online. Uh, you know, we talked e earlier about relapse and, you know, I think as both of you mentioned, uh, relapse is something to be expected because we're looking at addiction really as a, a chronic illness and it's going to have its ups and downs. But the specific question that was asked was, uh, you know, how do you, what would you suggest somebody do uh, if they, you know, are post-treatment, they've been in a residential program and um, they uh, experience something traumatic. And the example that was given was a friend of theirs overdosing. Uh, you know, what are some suggestions you might have for steps that a person in that situation should take? Um, Ella, do you want to uh, respond to that? Yeah, first of all, I want to, uh to uh, add something for the previous question, and I think it will be related to, that, to the current question. Uh, when someone is being interviewed to Retorno, uh, first of all, the, the best treatment is domestic or uh, at the beginning. If you can continue to live with this family and to get up in the morning and go to work and to help uh, full, uh, to fulfill his, uh, his achievements and all of that, and uh, to have full activities, that's the best treatment that a person can have. Can have, and uh, in parallel to those life, to go to a therapy, 
and the consultations and, and uh, all of those things. When someone is, has uh, the presence of uh, drugs in his life, what we recommend is first of all, go to a social worker or to a psychologist and to see, to an assessment to whether to see how severe, how, how severe is your addiction when, uh, and, uh, to see if you react to that treatment. The problem is that sometimes uh, that level of the psychologies people or, the, or their families are in denial. They're saying he is in treatment, he is uh, being supervised uh, in the psychologist and the addiction is uh, being continued. It can be also like for a couple of years in, uh, in this kind of situation. So the idea is to start with it, but if after like a couple of months, there is no serious change, uh, someone is not like getting into function, things like that, that you need to, to move forward for much more intensive, uh, intensive uh, treatment. Retodon community therapy is in the edge of the, of the spectrum. Like every, uh, the first, uh, it's not supposed to be your first intervention. It's not uh, supposed to be even like for an 18 years, uh, years old that is trying to uh, read with, uh, with his friends. It's not going to that directly, but it needs, it needs to, uh, to light a red, like a red light back, uh, back in the head and to be aware patient, the candidate himself or the family, that something is, uh, something is happening around, uh, around him. As for the relapse, what is happening, it's everyone that is like uh, getting out from the community, moving forward in his life, supposed to get some addresses and phone numbers and uh, to be part of an A groups or an uh, GA for gamblers, for everyone to be in part of the, of the clean addicts in his uh, in his area, to be in part of the welfare uh, welfare treatments and this relationships, this uh, bonding between people, it's the most important thing that all those uh, 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 events and uh, the, and. We tell the people actually what we took from you in this treatment is the uh, is the shield that you had to, uh, to deal with traumas in your life. You used drugs to deal as a shield, and we took the shield. So you need to grow a new shield with, uh, with the help. And uh, right after he got a relapse, uh, he got a relapse, and uh, uh, he had a trauma, some overdose, things like that. He has to go back to a therapy to reassess his situation, his risk factors, and all of those things. It's part of the, what we, uh, the instruments that we, uh, we explain about them uh, during the treatment. Okay, so if somebody... Um... Well, I would, um, just to say about someone who found out that a, 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 a friend died of an overdose. So I, I think that's a very traumatic experience and it is, Put, putting you at pretty high risk, actually. Um, patients that sort of know about others that died, um, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sort of, a, it's a, it's a real trauma, um, and you should probably make sure you're connected with, with if, if you can get connected with a therapist, that would be great. Support group. There are a lot of support groups for people after these situations. Trying to get connected with that, try to process that. Um, Unfortunately, it's the rule rather than the exception of people and that are suffering with serious substance use disorders that uh, these things happen. It doesn't mean I think that people who, I think that just because you've had friends and relatives, or not friends and relatives, but friends that, um, that, that unfortunately didn't survive the, the disorder, doesn't mean that you don't have to. And I think um, we should, it's just an opportunity, it's just a, a, I think should be a trigger to, to seek out more support um and uh and if you need to go back to an inpatient program um just you know if, if if it's too much stress in terms of risk of relapse um so that's what i would say uh, but it is i mean i you know it is i know it's a very tough situation right and and i think uh you know importantly as elad was saying that you know before that happens when one's leaving treatment to you know make sure to be bringing with them the contact information, the people, the supportive 
uh, people and, and places to turn so that when, you know, those moments do, uh, do occur as uh, the ups and downs of life may, may likely bring, you'll have them, you know, at the ready, but certainly, you know, uh, if somebody is experiencing something like that to, uh, to reach out and not, you know, kind of wait and see, will I relapse or will I not, but uh, to react to that trauma by seeking help. Um, okay, I'll just, uh, we are uh, running short on time. One uh, more question that uh, somebody uh, asked here, and I think goes back to, you know, something we talked about uh, close to the very beginning is, uh, you know, that um, people really uh, often don't conceptualize of themselves as, as uh, really being an addict or needing help. And, um, you know, the question that's asked here is what can somebody who is a friend um, who knows somebody who particularly the question was about uh, relapsing, you think they might have relapsed or might be heading in that direction. Um, you know, what, if anything, can, uh, you know, someone do for that other person, right? I mean, uh, you know, in many situations with uh, an adult, etc., there's very little that can be done to force them to do anything. So are there steps that, you know, one can take to help that person in their life? either. I'm happy to answer if you want. Um, so there's actually a whole side of the addiction field around uh, helping sub loved ones, friends, rel mostly relatives, um, spouses, parents, uh, with a loved one who's struggling with um, insight and, and motivation. Um, there are uh, there's a very nice free website if anyone wants to look at it written by a friend of mine um, called the 20-minute guide for families you can look at that um, it's based on uh, a therapy called craft which um, tries to coach loved ones in in in, in helping in, in in multiple ways one is um, not trying to be too controlling uh, pushing too hard sometimes will backfire um, learning to have a conversation around these things without being confrontational. Um, and then sometimes if you can uh, provide contingencies like good things for good behavior and maybe not providing feedback and, and with bad behavior. Um, those are, uh, there, there is, there is uh, resources out there and sometimes the, the loved ones are the more motivated than, than the person suffering from addiction themselves. Um, so I would sort of encourage you all to try to reach out and uh, to, to look at that website maybe read a, there's another there's a book called uh, how to get your loved one sober which is quite good um, there's also support groups um, for uh, people that are in the situation and get ideas from others um, the foremans have a, a program in, in TNAC that I think is online still meets every other week um, uh, which is I was involved with for a couple of years and excellent support group um, I don't know if people know about Leanne Neetail Foreman had a uh, had their own experiences with a relative of a substance use disorder, and they felt that we needed more community resources. So they started um, they started that, an organization, um, and they have a support group. If people are interested, the, the contact information is time two with the two, the number two, uh, talkaddiction at gmail.com. Um, you can look them up online and probably get the information. Um, those are all ways to, to get. I mean, I can't tell you what to do, but I, I think I can point out for hopefully if someone has the question, point you in the direction of trying to uh, to learn more about this. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, you talked about not being uh, too confrontational. So, you know, there's kind of the classic trope, which you, you know, see on, uh, you know, in movies and TV, or at least I have. And I know that, you know, kind of famously, John Mulaney uh, hosted Saturday Night Live and uh, just a few weeks ago and talked about how, uh, his, uh, his friends, uh, you know, conducted an intervention and all, you know, came with prepared speeches, et cetera, and, you know, shepherded him into, uh, uh, you know, going back to rehab. And, you know, he is somebody who's uh, been in, in rehab a number of times. Um, and, uh, you know, so is, is that kind of thing, the intervention, is that, um, you know, sort of more myth than reality in terms of its effectiveness? You want me to answer? So there's, there was a study that they, they compared different approaches to getting people into 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 detox or rehab. They found that the, the issue with intervention was that it was hard to follow through. And if people went, that's great. And a certain point, about I think a third went, um, or 25% went, and was able to enter treatment. 
But um, once you've done that, you sort of, if, if the motivation wasn't there at the moment, you kind of are out of bullets. You kind of threw everything at the person at once. Um, so I, I'm not against interventions, I, and sometimes it's it's sort of just the only way to go. Um, but I, I think taking sometimes taking a more nuanced approach, um, going a little slower, having a conversation. If it's clear the person's not ready, trying to move them in the right direction over time, and waiting till they're ready, and having the resources right away, that can be more useful. So, uh, but um, yeah, okay, great and. I'm not sure that all of the resources you mentioned we currently have on our website, so I'll be in touch with you afterwards and make sure we get them up on our website, including we have a books page on our website, and we'll put the books that you mentioned up there as well. Okay, so I think we're rounding out our time now. really want to thank uh, both uh, Dr. Shulman and Elad and uh, really the uh, whole staff uh, from Returno had a, a pre-meeting with a, a number of them and um, you know, really thank them for reaching out to want to share about their uh, treatment program. And, you know, as a lot mentioned, they have uh, quite a variety of different types of programming that they do. It's not all, um, you know, community-based uh, uh, programming, but uh, prevention and counseling and, and all kinds of different things. I encourage you to check out uh, their website, uh, which really uh, has uh, quite a bit of information there as well. And Dr. Shulman's been a longtime friend of Rufuat and Efesh and really appreciate his uh, taking the time once again to speak with us. And uh, no, Amma, you have uh, just one last thing oh, to say. Sure. We are uh, emphasizing in treatment to those people who is trying to help other addicts to come to treatment. It's a long term uh, goal to if you know that your friend is using drugs or someone is in a, in a start to develop an addiction it's really crucial to treat them with dignity, with respect. And uh, when I started working in addictions, I met a psychiatrist who told me in a sarcastic way, in the day that you will understand that, that every patient has the right to destroy his life, if you will respect this right, that you will start uh, to treat. And that right now, he made a choice to, to use drugs, and uh, to use those things. And we need to be with him and not to tell him in the terms like uh, you run away from your problems or you are just uh, choosing the easy way to deal with things. This is wrong. And the idea is I'm here. I know that you are dealing with something when I will always uh, keep asking you, how are you? And when you will be ready, I will be here to help you to get uh, more professional help. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a great note to close on. I think that we experience a lot in the, in the mental health world that people sometimes identify the person with their mental health disorder. And that uh, in some way uh, allows people to, you know, take away other people's humanity. Right. And uh, exactly. you know, the same thing is true about somebody who suffers from addiction. They are a person who suffers from addiction. They're not an addict. It's the entirety of who they are. And, uh, you know, only when we we deal with each other with dignity and realize that, uh, you know, we all have things that we have challenges and we all benefit from each other's help. But it's not that uh, one person is, uh, you know, knows knows better than all others how to lead life best, but it's, uh, it's a give and take process to help one another. And, um, you know, that's certainly the supportive community that we try and establish the roof for Hanefesh uh, as well. So uh, thank you for ending us on that note. And uh, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, it's been great speaking with both of you today. Thank you. Great to see you both. Take care.